Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Fight Song Sports Podcast. As always, my name is Ty Hansen. Joining me today, Bryson Lewis. And Bryson, there have just been a ton of things going on around the college sports world, um, so much so that we've just kind of felt the need that, um, you know, we're going to cover it all and, and, and just kind of bounce around and, and, you know, hit the highlights of everything that has happened from, uh, you know, all levels at, at all sports. Um, it's just been super busy and, and, you know, we just wanted to, you know, touch all of it as, as much as we could. Um, obviously, right now in the spring, um, college baseball, the, 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 the men's sport that is, is in the, um, you know, how do you want to say, um, you know, the most prevalent uh, men's sport right now in college. Um, it, it, it's been a crazy year for college baseball right now. Um, you know, we've seen um, Tennessee kind of take the reins as that number one team. Um, and they had a ton, a ton, a ton of drama, um, in, in the past week, uh, they had that 23 game win streak that they were riding and, uh, Tennessee tech who, um, you know, has had a, a phenomenal couple teams here in the past. Um, I believe made it to a super regional a couple years ago. I want to say, I know for sure they were in a regional. I want to say they advanced to a super regional. Um, they've got a great team there. They, they, they end up snapping Tennessee's 23 game win streak, um, Man, that was a that was a wild series, and I don't know. Did were you able to watch any of that or, or see any of the highlights? No, I did not. Man, it was it was crazy. Um, I, I wasn't able to watch, um, you know, any any of the games. Just busy with everything, but you know, I I was keeping up with them and saw the highlights. Uh, that Tennessee Tech team ends up beating them, and then they they uh, headed to the Alabama series at home, which was just crazy. Um, Alabama ends up beating, um, Tennessee to give them their first sec loss. I believe they were 12 and 0, um, and had beat some really good teams. I believe, uh, I know they swept Vanderbilt, um, and Missouri. And then I think South Carolina, um, and then obviously one more in there I'm forgetting. Um, but obviously it's the sec baseball. You're playing good teams every weekend. Um, they ended up winning that series, but Tony Vitello head coach for, um, Tennessee, Gets into it with the umpires. It was just kind of a weird situation. Um, one of Alabama's hitters hit a line drive back up the middle and, and hit the Tennessee pitcher. Um, and they and I, I, from what I heard, the Alabama dugout was kind of, um, you know, saying some things about the pitcher um, kind of as he was on the ground. And it was the pitching coach for Tennessee at first that kind of came out of the dugout and wasn't happy with um, everything that was being said. He was ejected. And then Vitello uh, came flying out of the dugout as well, was tossed, and then actually kind of really like chest bumped the umpire. It was kind of it, it was really weird, um, but he ends up getting suspended four games for that. Um, obviously, you're not allowed to um, you know make contact with any official in any sport um, as a player or a coach, um, and he he was suspended four games, um, so he'll be missing some time. And then separate from that. Uh, Tennessee went ahead and filed a report to the SEC about the performance of the umpires during the weekend. Um, the umpire who I believe it was in the first game of the series behind home plate, Jeff Messias, I'm assuming is how you say his name, uh, who is coach professor or coach umpired in professional baseball. Uh, he was behind the plate for that first game of that series. He missed 57 ball strike calls in a single game, 57. Uh, which is an absurd amount. Obviously you're going to miss calls and, and, you know, obviously like with, you know, you hear about robot umpires and the little, you know, strike zone they put on, on TV and everything isn't really the strike zone. Um, you know, pick, catchers frame on purpose. And if you miss spots, you're not going to get the calls. Um, so every umpire is going to kind of, you know, miss ball and strike calls, but 57 in one game is insane. Um, I don't blame Tennessee for filing a report. I don't know what that even entails. I don't know what they're looking for. Um, I don't believe that the game was played under protest by any means. I don't know how you play a game under protest for um, umpire performance, but it was just a wild series. And, and um, I mean, like it, it was just one thing after another, they had that win streak. They lost it, uh, had that undefeated sec record. Uh, you know, lost that obviously. And then, you know, your head coach gets suspended for four games for getting into it with an umpire. And then you end up filing a report for a separate umpire. And this Tennessee team, the way they play is electric, um, you know, but they play like super wild. I don't, I mean, have you ever, have you, have you watched any of their games? I know they played Oklahoma earlier in the year, 
um, and kind of just put a thrashing on them. Yeah, I've seen a couple highlights here and there, and obviously uh, they hammered OU early in the down in Arlington, I believe, but nothing outside of that really. Yeah, I mean, this team is like, you know, they're kind of catching a lot of flack, um, you know, mainly from kind of the older crowd of college baseball, but they um, kind of run their mouths in a good way because they back it up. Uh, they're not afraid to um, let you know that, that, you know, they're, they mean business and they're going to, uh, you know, beat the hell out of you. And they, and they go and do that. Um, but it, I mean, you get these situations where teams don't like Tennessee and uh, you know, they're, they're out to beat you. And, you know, not that that's, you know, necessarily a bad thing. Um, you know, they, they, they put the target on their back and they've accepted that role. Um, but, you know, they, you know, we've seen them kind of get into it with some teams and, and get, get pretty feisty. And, you know, they're led by obviously coach Tony Vitello, who, um, you know, you saw last year, obviously he was a former assistant at Arkansas under Dave Van Horn, um, you know, now a SEC rival against them kind of got into it last year. And even this year, Van Horn has said some things about how, um, you know, Tony Vitello has kind of gone off the rails a little bit, but, and that's how he motivates his team is just, you know, from, literally kind of just being crazy and um it just kind of pushes them to you know take that attitude into into the game and into their performance um but it's a fun team to watch and and um you know we'll see if they if they're able to like keep composure late in the late in the season um i think they're 33 and 3 right now i want to say um i believe it's one of the best uh starts to a college baseball season um, in history. I know there's like a couple of like 40 and O's, I think that have the record for best, but they were up there for, for definitely for one of the best. So. Yeah. I mean, teams like that and figures like that, like Tony Vitello is, it really makes sports. It's kind of what sports is all about. You get villains, people are rooting against you. I mean, you see the playing games last week in the NBA and Trey young, the Cavs fans are chanting F Trey young, the New York Knicks fans were doing it last season. And I mean, sports just, need villains and it makes it so much more fun to watch so much more intriguing uh because you just never know what's going to happen especially when an umpire misses 57 ball strike calls in one game <laughs> i mean it feels like you just got to be trying you got to be trying to perform that poorly i don't know it's incredible yeah and and when you get kind of uh you know i don't i don't want to say hothead but that's kind of what he is um with an umpire that bad it it can get ugly pretty quick and it did and just everything kind of boiled together and and in the whole for the whole series um you know but we'll we'll continue to move on and 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 we're going to stay in college baseball and there's one team that I want to talk about um who have kind of blown me away uh in in a different way than than most teams usually do um we're going to talk about the division 2 team Benedict College uh I believe out of South Carolina um the way that they play baseball is incredible. And I, to be honest, I had, I've never heard of this school um, until this year and just kind of, you know, thumbing through stats, I uh, just kind of noticed this and I've kind of followed them through um, probably the last 20, 25 games or so um, just kind of when they caught my eye. So they're five and 34 as a team. They're not great. Um, but they have 232 stolen bases in 38 games. The next highest is 147 stolen bases in 44 games. So they're almost 100 stolen bases ahead of second place. And they've done it in six less games. So Braden O'Connor is the leading stolen base or the stolen base leader, whatever you want to say, for this team. He has 79 stolen bases in 35 games. So he's averaging all, like over two stolen bases a game. And he's hitting like four something. His stats are crazy. They've got another guy on the team, Jamel Mitchell Jr., 51 stolen bases in 38 games. I mean, what I mean, that's what is that? 130 stolen bases between two guys. <laughs> They've still got nine games to go. And the NCAA record for stolen bases in a season is 96. And they did it in 49 games. So if Braden O'Connor, he needs um, what is that, 17 stolen bases? um in the next nine games which at the rate he's averaging he's gonna get it uh and that will be in in five less games which I guess they don't even I'm not sure how their conference tournament works um if every team makes it but if every team makes it they're gonna have a couple more games there um I, it, it it it's just crazy what they do and and it's not the first time they've ever done it uh they have they're they're plastered all over the NCAA record books uh for division two 
um, with, with stolen base records. They set the uh, season team season stolen base record in 2013 with 334 stolen bases in a single season. Um, their, their coach I know has been there for a while. Um, you know, it, it's definitely a different way to play baseball, especially now in an era where it's, um, you know, just a lot of home run hitting and we don't see a lot of stolen bases anymore. Um, you know, not only at the college level, but at the professional level as well. Um, to see a team play like this, I think is incredible. And, and they don't even get thrown out that much either. I mean, their caught stealing numbers aren't ridiculous. Um, they're pretty on par with, you know, how, how much they're stealing. Um, uh, it's crazy. And, and, you know, they're not, I mean, they're five and 34. They're not, you're not making the postseason. you know, they're not really a, a good team record wise, but you know, when you're doing that, I think it just deserves a little bit of attention. And it's just one of those things that just kind of flies under the radar. Yeah, absolutely deserves attention. And I mean, anytime you've got two guys that have sold 79 and 51 bases, I mean, those guys, those are two players on your team that alone are stealing more bases than full teams combined. I mean, even at the oh, division yeah. one level, like in a lot, a lot of teams, teams that are much better than them. I mean, those are just ridiculous, like video game numbers, like you're playing MLB and you're stealing every time you've got a guy on base and you're probably still not stealing that many bases. I mean, yeah. it's, it's unheard of. I mean, yeah, Braden O'Connor has 79 stolen bases in 35 games. So that's over two a game. So, I mean, you can either, I mean, that, I mean, you get on base and you steal first and, and or excuse me, you steal second and third. That's two, but he's still averaging even more than that. So not only is he stealing the bases when he gets on, but he's getting on more than just once a game as well. Um, I, and, and like I said, he's hitting like four something. I don't know his exact number. His on base percentage just has to be through the roof as well. Um, and, and, and Jamel Mitchell, uh, who is second on the team in stolen bases, is actually listed as a pitcher on the NCAA website. I'm sure probably a two-way guy. But, you know, when you, when you, when you pull him up on, on the um, stats leader, it literally says P right next to his name, um, which, you know, I'm sure when you're 5 and 34, probably everybody gets a shot at pitching. Um, but, yeah, I mean, just something I wanted to bring to light and something that kind of blew me away. I couldn't believe it, um, you know, when I – when I saw that probably, um, I want to say probably a month ago or so, um, I saw that and I literally didn't believe it. I had to like go in and like look at past years and like look at their website and everything. And I just like, couldn't believe it. Um, just, <laughs> it's just crazy. I, I, it's, it's just wild. Yeah, absolutely insane. I mean, I don't really know what else to say about it. It's like, it's kind of unbelievable. Even just like sitting here looking at the numbers. It's like, you just yeah. can't believe that there's a team out there that's playing like this. Yeah, I, and you would I, you would think with 232 stolen bases, you'd be able to win more than five <laughs> games, but I, you know, I don't know. The rest of the team just <laughs> – I, I, I don't want to trash them, obviously, but, you know, it, it, it's got to be – that's got to be tough. Um, and, then, and then moving on, just one more thing I, I wanted to clear up. I know in, in a couple episodes uh, ago I had um, – during – before the Nebraska Rutgers series, I had said that I, I, I doubted Rutgers a little bit. I doubted the strength of schedule – um, you know, they, they don't have the toughest strength of schedule in the world, but, you know, I, I said that they were a good team and, 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 you know, they were leading, um, you know, the big 10 and, and up there in the top of the NCAA for a lot of, uh, hitting categories, but, you know, I yeah. felt like maybe they were a little, their, their stats were, and numbers were a little bit flawed because of who they had played. Um, I was, I was wrong. This Rutgers team is really good. They're 30 and six and they're first in the big 10 right now. Um, this team's legit and, and, um, I was completely wrong. I just got to go. I just got to go back and acknowledge that, uh, you know, I, I underestimated a little bit and they absolutely have just proved me wrong. Um, so, you know, I gotta, I gotta go back and, and admit that one. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I don't remember exactly what the record was before that Nebraska series, but I don't think they've lost many games since you said that either. I I, I don't even know if they I have. Mean, they've I mean, they've only lost six Nebraska. all season, but like, I mean, that's, you got to eat your crow when it's there, but I mean, obviously not great strength of schedule. Like you said, um, I, are they ranked in any of the polls? I want to say they're I believe ranked so, one, of, yeah. one or two of they're them. Thir but... They're 31 and six now, 31 and six. And they've won, they've won 16 straight. So they're hot. I haven't lost yeah. at home either. I saw a thing on Twitter too, which it's uh, granted it's Rutgers baseball and you play in New Jersey, but their, <laughs> their scoreboard 
is on like a trailer and they like roll it out into left field. Like it's not even like in the ground. And this team's 31 and six and they won 16 straight games and play in the big 10. I mean, how are you in the big 10 and you even have a scoreboard at your field, but yeah, they're, I mean, they're really good. Um, they actually just played tonight and beat Iona 19 to one. Also a little side note, shout out to Iona. They had the world or the world, the uh, nation's longest losing streak. It was something like 27 or 30, 30 something games. Um, and they, they were able to finally win a game. They beat St. Peter's, who is also, um, a very, very, um, you know, one of the bottom feeders in, in division one, um, but they won a game. So congratulations to them. Um, and actually I, I feel, I feel bad saying it, but, uh, when you pull up, I own a baseball, uh, schedule for the year, they, uh, don't list their record on the website. Like it's just the games. So, you know, you click, you click schedule and it does, has no like record home and away, nothing. Uh, it just has the games. So I don't know that that's on purpose, but I will say that it is the only, the only team I've ever seen do that. So, yeah. Um, I mean, I don't blame them. I'm sure it's probably, <laughs> maybe they'll add it now. I mean, they've got to win. Maybe they'll think about they've got, Yeah, exactly. They've got to win. You can put it up there. Be proud of it. Yep. I mean, <laughs> man. And I mean, we had the win streak from Tennessee. And Iona won a game, I believe, like within a couple of days of each other, correct? Yeah. So um, 11.7, which is uh, a college baseball account on Twitter, they do a great job. One of the best, um, you know, covering college baseball uh, actually had like tweeted out a thing like which one ends first, uh, Iona's losing streak or Tennessee's win streak. And I think it was like the next day or like that night, maybe that it that both had happened. Um, so they I don't know, broke broke the curse or, or, or jinxed it for Tennessee, I guess. But yeah, um, they do a great job covering college baseball and, and you put out a lot of good stuff over there for sure. Yeah. Um, I'll just touch on OU real quick there. They went two and one over the weekend, beating Lamar twice or beating Pacific twice, excuse me, and losing to Lamar. Um, not a horrible weekend. Um, would you like to go three and oh, sure, but you can't win them all. Uh, they're taking on Wichita state tonight. They are currently up nine to five after six. Um, I believe they scored like six or seven just in the sixth inning here. Um, so they're going to the seventh right now, and we'll see if they can hold on to that lead as documented that has been a struggle of theirs all season. Um, and Wichita <laughs> State is usually pretty solid in baseball, so um, you can't over, uh, underestimate them. Yeah. Yeah. Which a powerhouse program in the Midwest. I've kind of, I've kind of fallen into some mediocrity in, in, in the past, you know, decade or so. Um, but, you know, I mean, they've got a great place there and, and, you know, I would love to see them getting back to, uh, you know, where they once were. Um, and when it comes to Nebraska baseball, I'm just not even, I don't, you know, just, it's at that point now where I just, you know, I don't even, we don't even need to go there. So. <laughs> Yeah, uh, we'll go ahead and transition over to a little bit of softball now. And obviously over the weekend, OU's uh, win streak of 40 games dating back to last season was snapped in the series finale against Texas on Saturday. Um, they just really didn't hit the ball very well. Uh, they didn't score until the seventh inning. Um, they were down 1-0 going into the sixth, and then Jordy Ball gave up three um, in the bottom of the sixth inning, and they went in. They got a girl on base. Kenzie Hansen hit a two-run home run, uh, and it looked like maybe there was a little bit of life, and then a fly out, um, and it basically was over from there. Um, I mean, kind of had to think that they were going to lose at some point. Obviously, it sucks that they did lose, but, I mean, I think down the stretch it'll probably help them. Ideally, they don't lose the first game of the College World Series this year and have to win like eight straight to win it all because uh, that's probably going to be impossible to do back-to-back -back years. But it's going to be something they learn from, and it'll be motivation for if they have to play Texas in the postseason, the Big 12 tournament, things like that. And they've still got Oklahoma State down the stretch here, who they are tied yeah. with for the top of the Big 12 yeah. now. Yeah, that I didn't realize that they were tied. That's actually crazy considering that they were literally 38-0 and then have lost one game, and, and you don't even have sole possession of uh, first place in the Big 12. Uh, it was bound to happen at some point. It's just the nature of, of um, you know, sports like softball and baseball. Um, I, it's not football where undefeated is, is kind of expected for the best teams in the country, Un undefeated even just for 38 straight games um, or, or 40 if you want to date it back to last year um, is unheard of. It's, 
I, I wouldn't look too far into it. You, you get beat, you're going to get beat. Um, and I think it's probably going to motivate this team a little bit, not only because the fact that they lost, uh, but also the fact that it was Texas. Um, and if there's one team you don't lose to at Oklahoma, it is Texas. Um, and you know, I, I, I think it, you know, probably lights a little bit of a fire under them. And, um, it, de- it definitely wasn't a team that I was worried about getting complacent at all, but, um, you know, maybe if there was any of that, I definitely think this just, um, you know, nips it away and, and they're going to be right back on track. Um, uh, at this point, they, they legit could finish a season with one loss, um, which would, you know, suck, but, um, you know, the fact that it was just one game that got away from you, but I mean, oof, that's, that's pretty incredible. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what the record is for, you know, best, best record in, in college softball history, but I would think a one loss regular season would probably, probably have it. Yeah, absolutely. And like you said, I mean, especially against Texas, I mean, that's the team that OU, that was their first loss against Texas since 2014. They were 23 and 0 wow. entering the game on Saturday since 2014 wow. against Texas. Um, so that's absolutely going to light a fire under them. But something interesting is Mackenzie Donahue did not travel with the team uh, down to Austin last weekend. Um, Patty Gasso says that is due to personal matters. She didn't really want to get into much more than that. Uh, Donahue obviously bursted onto the scene last season. She started 31 games, uh, a star in the Women's College World Series and was really a fan favorite coming into this season. But she started, I believe, less than 20 of the 39 games that they've played this season. And, I mean, the games that I've attended, they've, I mean, obviously they're run ruling a ton of teams. Almost all of their wins are by run rule. Um, And they're rotating a ton, so that probably has a little bit to do with it. But I'm sure going from basically a full-time starter 31 games last year to less than half of the games this season has probably taken a mental toll on her. And I believe even Jocelyn Allo, um, either her freshman or sophomore year also took time away from the team. Um, so I wouldn't really say that's anything to worry about right now. Um, we'll see if she returns later down, uh, down the stretch here in the season. I, I believe she hit three home runs in a game in the college world series, right? Last year. Yeah. I, I think against, I think against UCLA, she hit three in a game. Uh, but you know, I mean, college sports are hard and, and, you know, it, it's, um, you know, sports are hard in general, whether, you know, no, no matter what level you're at, but especially at college um, it, it's just a different animal and, and everybody goes through their you know own personal struggles, you know, whether you're um, you know, a, you know, someone who never plays or, or a star on the team and, you know, what, you know, it, it could just be, it could just be even your, your life away from, from sports at all. Um, you know, and, you know, I, I don't know, and, and I, I know you don't know or have any insight into that, and, and not that it really matters. Um, but, you know, I mean, as you mentioned, it, it also has to be hard um, going from pretty much a full-time starter and, and one of the key players on the team to um, starting to split time a little bit. But, you know, that's kind of the nature of when you play at a program like Oklahoma for softball is, you know, I mean, the, the freshmen coming in are pretty much as good as everybody else um, on the team right away, um, and there's always competition there. Uh, but, you know, as I mentioned, it, it, it doesn't have to be, you know, with softball or anything. I mean, it could be, um, you know, just the rest of your life that you're having, um, you know, some battles with and, and you know, when, you know, taking the time to deal with that means that um, you're not able to dedicate, you know, your, yourself 100 percent to the softball team. And um, I mean, we, you know, we've seen it in, in not not just softball, but, um, you know, we've seen it at. At, in football and basketball and baseball. Um, and we've seen it at all levels, you know, whether that be, um, you know, division one, division two, or even, you know, professional, um, it, it's just part of life. And, and, um, I think, you know, one of the fortunate things about, um, you know, sports in, in 2022 is that it's getting more awareness, um, and it's becoming more, um, you know, I don't want to say acceptable because it was never wrong, but, you know, I want, you know, 10 years ago, if this happened, it would be a little kind of frowned upon, um, you know, kind of a suck it up and get out there, you know, all, you know, you, you know, you get, you get paid to be here, look at the facilities you have, you know, you're on a, you're on a winning team, you know, how could you not be happy? Um, and that's not necessarily how it is all the time. Um, but you know, it, 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 it happens to everybody. And, and, and I think it's definitely just becoming more, um, you know, of a, um, you know, I hate, you know, acceptable is the word coming to my mind, but it, you know, not that it was ever, 
uh, frowned upon, but it, it's just becoming more prevalent in a good way um, and just getting some more awareness. So, yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. And I mean, like you said, I mean, it's taking an over in every sport. It seems like there's somebody that's stepping away. I mean, we even saw Simone Biles from the Olympics, who was yeah. the best yeah. gymnast in the world, and she withdrew. Um, so obviously hope Donna who comes out from whatever she's struggling with at the moment um, and Absolutely. hope to see her make a good return to the team. Uh, but we're going to kind of flip over to college football now and kind of an interesting week in the transfer portal. Um, first, Amarius Mims goes into the portal and uh, Florida State reporters, as they have kind of become known to do <laughs> over the last couple of years, kind of jumped the gun on throwing something out there like, a couple of years ago, they said Bob Soups was going to be their next head coach. This time it was Amarius Mims was close to committing to Florida State on a visit. Um, and a couple of days later, he decides he's going to return to Georgia. Not really sure what that was about. Just wanted to yeah. take a couple of trips, I guess. When? Maybe a couple of free trips. Not really sure. Yeah, right. When did he when did he enter the portal? I believe like it was he hasn't been in long, right? Yeah, I believe it's like he was in for less than a week. Yeah, I mean, I'll try to find the date real uh, quick, but yeah. he's already it's, out of the portal as well. So, yeah, and it's Florida State. They do that. They do that about everything. Um, oh yeah, and and you know, and a, as you had sent to me on Twitter, they also bite on everything, whether that be uh, completely <laughs> ridiculous or not. Um, it that's Florida State. They not not to trash Florida State fan base or anything, um, but they when it comes to football, especially have kind of one of the more ridiculous fan bases. Yeah. And I mean, it's kind of understandable. I mean, it, a lot of it comes from the reporting side of it, but I'm sure when, that is, yeah, I mean, yeah. obviously Florida state was a top tier program from oh yeah the whole time Bowden was there. And then uh, and up until the end of the Jimbo years, when he just kind of left them dry uh, to head to A&M, yeah. but I'm sure that's taken a toll on them. They've obviously struggled for the past, yeah five, yeah. six years, however long it's been now. Um, but, I mean, it would have been a huge get. And he decides yeah. to go back to Georgia. Just, I mean, maybe something will come out about why he wanted to enter the portal. I mean, he was a starter last year, I believe. So, and, I mean, national championship team, I don't really know. Yeah. Um, but that's kind of the nature of the game right now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, you'll never know. But, um for me, when a guy enters the portal and then, and then, and then jumps back um, to the school that he was already at within like, you know, less than a month. I mean, as you mentioned, like it might not even have been a week um, that just kind of makes you wonder like, why, like, why, like, why did you go into the portal? Like, did you plan to come back anyways, but you just wanted the trips, you know, or um, I don't know. And I think that's kind of the, some of the things that might give the portal kind of bad rep a little bit um is, is situations like that but you never know um you know there also might have been some kickbacks on the back end that, that don't get reported about um but you know well i not that i know anything i don't know anything so yeah um but seven banks transfers to lsu from ohio state uh former starting corner for the buckeyes i believe his sophomore and junior year uh and then this last year i believe he was a true senior kind of uh, dealt with some injuries, excuse me, down the stretch, uh, didn't play the last three games, and maybe just a guy that sees the writing on the wall, uh, sees a team at LSU, had a down year last year, needs some help, um, and sees a chance from the start down there, make an impact. Yeah, I mean, um, brand new situation down there, obviously moving on from Coach O um, and to Brian Kelly, who has had some mixed reviews so far. Um, but obviously LSU is a, you know, powerhouse, not only in, S in the SEC, but, um, you know, across college football, um, for, you know, a lot, I mean, dominated the, the, the two thousands and the 2010s and, um, you know, even in, even in 2000, what was it? 19 with Burrow. Um, and that, you know, not, obviously not just Burrow, that whole team was loaded, um, and, and just kind of hitting the reset button there, moving on for Coach O. You got Coach Kelly. Um, and just looking for a fresh start, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, he'll have one more season, I believe. Uh, this will be his COVID season, I assume. Uh, he's played four years at Ohio State. Uh, so we'll see if he can make an impact for LSU. Uh, next up, we had 
Ajayi Hall transferring from Alabama to Texas. Um, I don't know. I mean, he's a guy with tons of talent, but also lots of red flags. Um, I believe he tweeted out during the season that he was leaving the Alabama program and then decided he was coming back um, and even quote or not quote tweeted um, subtweeted Nick Saban during the year about not being able to play. And I mean, especially with some of the stuff that we've seen going on with Texas and their media um, and Sark saying that Moro Ojomo, who kind of brought about issues that everybody has been talking about from the outside on Texas and how guys are just there and they want to go out sixth street and party, blah, blah, blah. And Stark suspends him. And it kind of sounds like a match made in heaven when you look at it from that angle. <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, the dude's legit. Uh, he's an absolute playmaker and um, you know, him with Quinn Ewers and Xavier worthy, uh, you know, all on one offense and, and John Robinson as well. Um, that that's pretty scary, but I'm not a huge Stark fan, um, you know, for multiple, multiple reasons. Um, but if things get straightened out down there, I think, I think Texas could be really, really good. Um, well, you know, we'll just have to see. I think if you, you know, you put a, um, um, you know, and, and obviously Nick Saban, that's a given, but, you know, even, even a, uh, you know, a Bob Stoops or, um, you know, hell, even Dabo down there. Um, I think it's a different story. Just somebody who has uh, won a little bit, obviously Sark, I think is, is a great coach and, and you got to be a good coach to, to get the head job at Texas, you know, whether or not it works out or not. Um, but I'm just not the biggest fan of Sark. Um for multiple, multiple reasons. Um, and obviously he's had his issues in the past too, but if they can get everything moving in the right direction, um, they got Gary Patterson there as well. So, um, you know, maybe Gary Patterson can just knock some sense into, into that program. Um, and, you know, obviously a very successful coach at TCU for, for a long time. Um, they're Texas is looking dangerous, at least from, you know, the offensive side. Um, but, they did lose to Kansas last year, so can't 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 forget that. Yeah, um, I mean Texas, obviously their team that always has a lot of talent. Kind of made some waves. ESPN's FPI came out this last week, and they were number six. Yeah. Um, a lot of that is based on past coaching success, and obviously a lot of that staff was at Alabama for multiple years with Nick Saban, uh, won a national yeah. championship in 2020. Um, so that contributes to it. And then obviously Texas always recruits very well. Um, but they're going to have to find a way to figure it out. I mean, Quinn Ewers, phenomenal talent, hasn't taken a meaningful college football snap. Yeah. I think took like three snaps all year last year for Ohio State. Um, and, I mean, they're going to have to figure out their offensive line. Their offensive line has been poor for, I mean, five, six years now. They just have yeah. – they haven't had the guys down there. They haven't had the coaching down there. Um, but they just signed seven offensive linemen and maybe the future they get it going turned around but i mean it's at least probably another year for them of mediocre offensive line play most likely because I, I mean that's probably the most difficult position for a true freshman to step in and start yeah for sure um but i you know also gonna play devil's advocate here i think this is probably the most talent texas has had um in a long time, a long time. Um, obviously they have, you know, talent every single year. It's Texas. Um, but I, I mean, the guys that they've got right now are, I think are really, really good. Um, and I, I would say probably one of the most talented Texas teams, at least on the offensive side that we've seen in a while. Yeah. I mean, I completely agree. Their offense is stacked. Um, defense was very, very so-so last year. I mean, they gave up 50-plus to Kansas, um, which, I mean, just shouldn't happen. Um, <laughs> but you did that in 2018, and I left the stadium just pissed, um, rightfully <laughs> so. I mean, uh, Puka Williams ran for, like, 200 yards yeah. that night. Um, yeah. But, I mean, like you said, they've got Gary Patterson down there. He's absolutely going to have a hand in that defense, even though he is in an off-the-field role, I believe. Um, yeah, he should help them. I mean, I, if he doesn't help them, I don't know what to make of it because he's Gary Patterson. He's been one of the best defensive minds in the game 
for like 20 years now. Um, yeah. But we'll have to see. I mean, they play Texas in week two or, th- or Texas plays Alabama, excuse me, in week two or three. And I mean, they're coming off a national championship loss, returning basically everyone. Um, and I believe they are Alabama's hammer. Alabama's hammering. Alabama might beat them by 60. <laughs> they might beat them by 60. Oh, for, um, oh 100. Yeah, 100%. Especially considering Nick Saban lost two games to assistants last season, one being Jimbo Fisher, one being uh, Kirby Smart in the national championship game. And those were the first two occurrences of that ever. Yeah. He's probably going to be coming out looking to make a point. And I'm sure his team will be ready as they always are. Um, kind of uh, switching over to Alabama there as well. They had their spring game last weekend. I didn't really see any of it. I don't really think anybody needs to see any of it. I mean, they're going to be phenomenal, obviously, returning almost everybody. Um, but one thing, their spring game attendance was very poor. I obviously shared that picture with you um, that I saw yeah. on Twitter, and it was just basically empty. Um, yeah. I don't really know what the deal is there. I mean, I guess you probably don't want to see a spring game. I mean, they probably know what they've got. Maybe the fans really just aren't bought in like that. I mean, I don't want to say bought in. They're obviously bought in, but, like, yeah, they don't really want to. It just kind of surprised me. I mean, I don't even know if there was, like, 10,000 people there. Like, I think 10,000 would probably be a stretch. I mean, the place was literally empty, 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 empty. And, it, I mean, it's Alabama. Like, I mean, they pre- they pack Bryant-Denny every single weekend. And, yeah, I, I get to spring game. Alabama's going to go 11 and one, whatever, 12 and 0 next year. I mean, you can pretty much just pencil it in. I get it. Nobody cares. It's a spring game, but like, oh man, I mean, like you can't get, I mean, you can't get, you know, even 20,000, like you don't even, you don't have to pack the place out. You don't have to be one of the, like the leaders, you know, but I mean, it was just, it was empty. And for a team that is consistently, in the national championship game every single year for like what, I mean, 10 years plus now, 15 years, I guess we're approaching. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, I would, I would want to go if I lived in Tuscaloosa, Alabama um, and I was a Bama fan. I don't see why I wouldn't be going. Yeah, I completely agree. And I do have the officially announced. Um, Let's hear it. Number. They reported 31,077. No people. shot. No you shot. You guys can go there's look no up the way. picture yourself. The picture is circulating around. I, there's just no way that there were no 31,000 people in no that way. I mean, no I know way. it holds like it holds like 95,000, but like literally only the first like 15 rows are filled and they're not even filled in the end zones. Um, I don't know. It's odd to me. I don't know. I mean, OU is probably expecting 60,000 plus at their spring game this weekend. Obviously there's some um, extenuating circumstances that are helping with that as OU. I mean, I think the most they had with Lincoln Riley was like 50, 55. Um, But it's not really traditionally a thing that OU fans pack the stadium for. Uh, But I mean, it's Alabama and it was just kind of surprising. And then one other thing from Alabama I did see that was kind of funny. Um, I guess the winning team gets like a different meal than the losing (laughs) team. And yeah. Dallas Turner was trying to hand some cake over to a teammate that was on the losing team. And Nick Saban <laughs> was just having absolutely none of it. Yeah. Yeah. I saw that too. It was so funny. It was so funny. Like, just, and I think that's just like some of the little things that like makes Nick Saban, like such a phenomenal coach. Like, I mean, it literally was a slice of cake. Like, does it matter? Like, is it going to, is it going to like, is it going to make them, you know, lose one more game or, you know, be a worse team this year? probably not one piece of cake, but it's just like the little things and the expectations and just the competitiveness that goes on um, at, at Alabama that I think, you know, it's the little things that, that, you know, win you games. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's, it's interesting. It was really, really funny to see. Um, and I think it's just on par for Nick Saban. Um, and like you said, why is one of the best, but we've got the OU spring game coming up this weekend. Like I said, they're expecting to pack it out. I don't think that the upper decks will be full. The forecast might scare a few people off. There's supposed to be some scattered storms around the state. We'll see. Um, Obviously, it's Oklahoma, and they usually can't predict the weather seven hours in advance um, (laughs) on most days very, very accurately, um, especially when it comes to storms. Uh, The weather's just always changing in Oklahoma. But there will definitely be some interesting things to watch there. 
We have no idea what uh, formation the defense is going to be based out of. Um, I'm sure we'll see like six or seven different looks from Brent Venables. Um, but something really interesting and concerning at the same time, Brent Venables had a press conference today after their final day of spring practice. And he said that Dylan, Gray, Dylan Gabriel would be taking snaps with both uh, the red and the white team. It's interesting. I think, I mean, probably just, I mean, he's obviously the guy. He doesn't know a lot of the wide receivers like that well. He's probably just going to build some chemistry with them. But also, there's not a lot of depth at quarterback. Obviously, lost Spencer Rattler, Caleb Williams. Um, and outside of that, it's really Nick Evers, true freshman. And then Micah Bowens, I guess, is technically on scholarship, but he has literally never seen the field since the last spring game. Um, a Penn State transfer that didn't factor into their plans at all. Um, and then a couple walk-ons. So it's definitely concerning, I think. They're definitely going to need to go get a, another quarterback in the portal. I'm sure the portal is going to get going a little bit here again after spring ball ends for all these programs. There's like 40 or 50 uh, spring games this weekend. So that's something they're absolutely going to need to do because if Dylan Gabriel goes down in the regular season, um, yeah. OU will be in a world of hurt. Yeah. And, and I wouldn't, I don't think I would look too much into it. I think it surprises me a little bit, but it's also a spring game. And I mean, it doesn't I mean, it's you, you know, you see points all, you know, everybody plays a different game and you count points different ways. And, you know, some are offense versus defense and some are, you know, red versus white and, you know, first team versus second team, or you, or you mix them a little bit and everybody does it differently. I wouldn't look, I don't think I'd look too much into it. I mean, it's a spring game. So. Yeah. Um, we'll see. I mean, hopefully they finish the game out. As I mentioned, I think on one of the previous episodes that hasn't always happened in the past. Um, <laughs> But it'll be really interesting, especially on the defense side of the ball. Um, just see where guys are lining up, uh, what formations they're in, 4-2-5, 3-4, 4-3, whatever it might be. Um, and it obviously won't be ones versus ones because um, they're just splitting the teams up evenly for the most part in a draft style thing. But it'll be good to see a lot of the new faces. Obviously lost a lot to the transfer portal, picked up a lot. Um, it's going to be interesting to watch. And I say watch, you're basically going to have to go in person if you want to watch it. Um, shout out Bally Sports for buying out Fox Sports Southwest. Horribly run company. Half their airtime is taken up by literally nothing. Um, and they're not showing the spring game. I think they're re-airing it like the day after. Um, so just tough situation if you want to watch the OU spring game. Um, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, I the TV stuff's getting so out of hand. It's so bad, and, and we're going to talk about it a little bit later um, on here. Obviously, I've got some notes in it, but just yeah. it's ridiculous. Like, yeah. Um, but we'll obviously be watching that this weekend. Um, but we'll go ahead and switch over to college basketball. Just a couple quick notes. Uh, just a ton of guys continue to enter the portal. Um, it's just a free for all right now, kind of like I was talking about with college football, but I mean, to a whole nother level, I mean, there's over a thousand people in the portal right now. Um, I think last off season college basketball reached over 2000 in the portal. Um, and I think that's just the way the game is going to be played until the NCAA wants to step in and put restrictions on it. Um, who knows, but Elijah Harkless commits to UNLV. Uh, obviously, the coach out there is Kevin Kruger, former OU assistant and son of Long Kruger, uh, goes back home towards the West Coast. And it's interesting. Obviously, everybody was surprised when he entered the portal. I think him going to UNLV, um, it was a team they really weren't even close to the bubble last year out in the Mountain West, who had like three or four teams into the tournament. I think maybe there was a talk that coming off this injury, he probably wasn't going to be a starter next year, but go in as a rotational player and have to earn his way back in, uh, especially in a knee injury. We still have no idea how severe that was, but I think that just kind of tells you where that was at. And then AK Moane commits to Sacramento State following Coach Patrick out there, uh, which we discussed last week was probably to be expected. Um, no news other than that outside of the portal for OU basketball. Um, we'll just kind of see, I'm sure guys are going to continue to enter the portal, um, big names as well. If I had to imagine just the way that the game is being played right now. Yep. 
everything you said that's pretty much yeah a lot of, i mean it, it's just how it is a lot of guys in the portal now and, and teams are going to build off of it before they go after freshmen yep i completely agree uh so we'll go ahead and switch over to college golf now and it was a really really interesting uh weekend um ou was out at the thunderbird collegiate just a stack tournament hosted by asu out in arizona um, obviously Arizona state top five team in the country. OU's number one, uh, out there. I believe Oklahoma state was also out there. Texas tech was out there. Yeah. Um, North Carolina was out there. All those are top 10 teams. So just a phenomenal tournament out there. And OU ends up winning at 31 under, uh, beating Arizona state by five, but it was kind of a interesting turning. I mean, they played the first two rounds on Friday and I believe the final round was on Saturday. Um, I may have gotten those days wrong, but they played the first two rounds on the same day. Uh, but it was kind of, it was really, really tight early. Oklahoma, Arizona State, and Oklahoma State were all within three shots of each other. Uh, and then going into the third round, Gupta for Oklahoma State, I believe shoots like nine over something. Um, yeah. And they just kind of fall back. And OU ends up winning by five, obviously gets back into the winner's circle. Like we talked about last time, they had to kind of get it going again after a couple fourth place finishes. And that's exactly what they did. Yeah, especially in a stack tournament like that, that's a good one to win um, for sure. And um, I mean, that that lineup that's, that was in that tournament is going to be the lineup you see in, in, in the national championship for the most part. I mean, those are the best teams in the country. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and like we were just talking about in the college football segment with the TV stuff, um, yeah. I texted you and I sent you a screenshot of the leaderboard. And obviously on golf stat, they've got the rankings of the teams right there next to uh, yeah. the team names. And you see like one, five, seven, four, two. And I was like, how is this not televised? And like <laughs> I go on golf channel, not televised. And uh, the RBC Heritage was on CBS at this point because it was in the afternoon. And I'm just like, I don't, I mean, this is, all these guys are going to play at the next level, whether that's on the PGA or the Corn Ferry Tour. I mean, this is kind of the future and it's literally the top five teams in the country. Yeah. And I, I was kind of blown away. And, and, you know, I know, and, and my thought was kind of like, oh, okay. Like golf channels not showing it. And then I was like, wait, I guess I, I, like, I can't go to like OU's website or Arizona state's website to watch it. Like, you know, football and, and basketball and softball and baseball, all you got to do is just go to the website, you know, OU, OU baseball, whatever, da, da, da. And then you click on the little camera and, and then you're watching it, you know, or, you know, that it's that way with some smaller levels, you might have to pay for ESPN plus or something. And there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of games on, on ESPN plus um, to watch, but you know, obviously golf is not the easiest sport in the world to televise. You know, you can't just set up one camera behind home plate like you can for, you know, baseball and softball. Um, you know, it, you know, you can set up one camera on like 18 and you get to watch like, you know, one group putt at a time. It's, it's a difficult sport to televise. But with that being said, you know, I, I saw that lineup and, you know, not only with the lineup, but especially with how close it was late. It was like, dude, I want to, like, I want to watch and I can't even watch. I mean, these are the best players in college golf right now and I can't watch. And this is like fresh off of the masters the week after the masters, right? Everybody's golf interest is peaked right after the masters. This is a perfect time to show college golf because you've got, you know, the people who don't keep up with it, um, you know, are, are, are reinvested again because, um, you know, you just, you're coming off that master's high. Um, it's the best tournament in the world and, and people are, you know, back into the golf season and, you know, the fact that it wasn't even televised, I couldn't even watch it was, it was, it was like, dang, I was really frustrated. And, um, you know, I, I will host the Hawkeye Invitational again this weekend, um, at, at, at Finkbine up there in Iowa city and, you know, Kansas and Iowa kind of ran away with it. I think, I believe they're the only two teams that were under, uh, under par. And I think, Iowa won by like one shot or two shots. And, and it just kind of goes back to, um, you know, I, I was looking at the leaderboard and I was like, man, I want to watch this and I, and I can't watch it. Um, you know, I understand it's difficult to, you know, to, to, to televise and, and, you know, um, promote golf because you do have to kind of um, put it on like more of a national scale, um, you know, than you can just kind of on the website. But I mean, you're watching the, you know, the best of the best play and, and you can't watch. I mean, um, you know, I know, I know it's not comparable to football or, or to basketball, but 
I mean, imagine, you know, the, you know, number one and, and, and number two and number three and number four and number five all playing and you can't watch. Like, it's just, I think it's just kind of ridiculous. Like, you know, I mean, you know, at the beginning of the season, who all is going to be there, what teams are going to be there. Like, how do you, how do you not have that set up? I don't know. But yeah, I completely agree. Um, I mean, I was even looking like I figured maybe ASU was hosting it. Maybe there'd be something on their website like, oh, you can watch it here. And I mean, the only thing I could find was some sketchy YouTube link. And he was like, oh, click the link in the description to watch this tournament. And it was like, uh, yeah, I'm just not going to be doing that. I mean, it's just, it's just a bunch of red flags there. Um, it's just kind of crazy. I mean, it's like five or six all top seven, eight teams in the country. and I mean, maybe it's a budgeting issue with the schools. I mean, golf is probably not making any revenue of most schools and the athletic department just won't spend the money to set something up. I don't know. Um, but we've got to find a way to get more of the smaller sports out there. Um, and I say smaller, like, yeah. I mean, college golf is big. I mean, it's televised when it's in the postseason. Um, obviously college baseball when MLB was um, struggling to come to an agreement to start their season everybody was pushing to get more games televised there. Um, and then you've got the MLB network blackouts when I was trying to watch uh, OU that first opening weekend. And it's just something that I think all sports need to be better at outside of like football and basketball, which are obviously already widely televised. Yeah. It, yeah. It's frustrating. I mean, I, it, you know, I mean, people watch basketball and, and football and as you should, I mean, when it's, you know, when it's fall, I mean, watch football and when in March madness is on, you know, watch, watch basketball. Um, but I mean, when all of those sports are, are away, I mean, like in the football, like in the fall, you've got football and in the spring, you've got basketball and then in, or excuse me, in the, in the winter, you have basketball. And then in the spring, you've got, you know, baseball and golf and softball and they just, it just doesn't get the attention. And then, you know, it's, it's not like they're competing against anything. It's not like people are watching football instead. I mean, you've got the spring games, but as you mentioned earlier, OU is not even televised. It's not like you're watching that instead. Like you've got nothing else to watch. Like, like the NBA playoffs, you want to watch a play in game? Okay. I mean, I guess whatever. Like, I don't know. I mean, like, it's just, I mean, you, yeah, you can watch like Division One, you know, the, the SEC baseball, you know, front, you know, but like that, that's it. I mean, that, that's all that gets shown on ESPN, you you by ESPN, ESPN Plus, excuse me. I mean, it's just not, it just doesn't get the attention. Like, I mean, you're watching the, the, like the best of the best play. Um, and, and you got to pay a monthly subscription for it. I mean, if you had like Alabama versus Georgia in a regular season sec matchup in football and you had to pay ESPN plus for it, like people would be pissed and it would get changed like that, but because it's baseball and it's not, you know, the revenue generating sport, like I get, I get that. I get money talks, but it's like, Maybe if you, you know, you also have to spend money to make money. And if you promoted it and put it out there and televised it and got people to the games, like maybe you would probably end up making money, but I guess that's just too ridiculous to, you know, and not just baseball golf too. I mean, like whatever. I mean, yeah. Uh, I mean, I completely agree, but I will say don't knock the playing games, man. Shout out Paul George, shout <laughs> out Kawhi Leonard. They don't play much all season. They're in the playing game. Shout out to them for losing the playing game. Paul George, obviously out. Kawhi didn't play. Um, Help our Oklahoma City Thunder lock up a second lottery pick. Um, yep. So shout out to them. Uh, but we'll keep it on college golf for just a second. The conference tournaments are getting underway for um, a lot of these teams. I know some of the smaller conferences have already gotten underway um, over the beginning of this week. Uh, OU women, I believe, start on Thursday, I believe. And then OU's men, the Big 12 tournament starts next Monday. Um, in Trinity, Texas at Whispering Pines, I believe. Um, so that'll be something to watch. Obviously, OU Texas, OSU Texas Tech. Um, it'll be really, really interesting tournament to watch. And I'm not sure if it's televised or not. I would hope that it is. I mean, it's the Big 12 tournament, but you never know. No, you don't ever know. So, I mean, speaking of, speaking of what to watch this weekend, um, you know, fortunately, if you can, um, no, I know ESPN does actually, um, if you have ESPN plus at least does a pretty good job televising, um, you know, softball and baseball. Um, if you, if, you know, if you pay the monthly subscription to watch, to watch, you know, to watch, um, but Arkansas and Florida played this weekend in, in, in softball, Arkansas being ranked sixth, 
uh, and Florida 10. So you got a top 10 matchup in the SEC right there in softball. Um, that's going to be a much watch, must watch series there for sure. Um, you know, basically just those teams fighting for second place uh, at this yeah. point. Um, absolutely. I mean, obviously, Arkansas kind of, I mean, I don't want to say new, um, but I mean, obviously, SEC is usually Alabama, Florida. Those are two teams that are almost annually in the Women's College World Series. Um, and then Auburn has had a few good years um, over the last decade or so. But I mean, I got to think that'll probably be on the SEC network if it's not on one of the main ESPN channels. Um, and that's absolutely going to be a series to watch. That's two teams that have a really good chance to um, make it to the Women's College World Series in Oklahoma City. Yeah, those are two two teams that we have a good shot at seeing in, in Oklahoma City for sure. Um, and then outside of that, you obviously have the spring games. Um, as you mentioned, there's like 40 or 50 something this weekend. Um, most teams, I think, get it done this weekend. Um, OU, USC, Oregon, Texas, uh, as we all have listed here, um, some of the powerhouse programs there. Um, getting theirs out of the way. Um, I believe I, I, I don't know if there's anybody after this weekend. Like I think this weekend's pretty much like the last weekend. Um, yeah. I think this is schools that get it before, but yeah, I think this is uh, the last major weekend. I'm sure there's probably one or two stragglers out there, yeah. um, but this is definitely the big weekend um, for the rest of the major programs. Obviously, like I said, you're going to have a tough time finding the OU game anywhere. Um, if you're interested, maybe check out Twitch. I know there's been a guy over the last few years. OU always has one pay-per-view game. Um, but they make like $30 million off of whatever the number is. Um, and he's always streamed it on Twitch. So maybe he'll be out there saving the day again. Um, other than that, you're going to have to pay Sooner Sports TV uh, to be able to watch it live. I think USC is going to be on one of the ESPN networks. Oregon, I think, is Pac-12 network. And Texas is Longhorn network, if you have that. Um but, I mean, those are all really intriguing uh, spring games. Obviously, Texas, Quinn Ewers coming in, Oregon, new coaching staff, USC, Lincoln Riley, Caleb Williams out there, OU, entire new coaching staff. Um, so kind of a big weekend for those programs. A lot of new faces. Yep, absolutely. Um, and then also this weekend we've got number three, Oklahoma State, taking on number 21, TCU, in Big 12 baseball. Um, obviously, two very, very good baseball programs there. Um, and they're certainly going to put together a must watch series for us. Yeah, man, that's big 12 baseball. You get, um, I mean, hell we say it every week. Um, you know, it's one of the best in the country and, and, and every week you get, uh, you get some, you get some a plus matchups and, and, you know, it's another top 25, um, conference series. Um, and, and it could go either way. Both teams are, are loaded um, really good. I mean, TCU, obviously a college world series staple, never been able to get it done. Um, Oklahoma state as well. Um, you know, for the last 50 years, um, I, I believe this series is at Oklahoma state. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure it's at Obrate. Um, their brand new stadium there just the second year they've had that open and it's just gorgeous. If you've never been there, um, it's probably the best stadium in the country. And, and, and if you've never, if you've never been, it, it's worth the trip. It's worth the trip for sure. Um, you know, whether you're uh, an Oklahoma state fan or not, um, I've been to a couple of games there and it's just, uh, it's like a minor league park. It's incredible. Yeah. Um, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, I've never been there for a game, but obviously been up there a few times, um, bedlam visiting friends, whatever it might be. And it's just, it's an incredible facility. Uh, it looks like it's an SEC baseball facility to be honest. And, and that's something where OU is lacking in the baseball department. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's going to be an incredible series to watch. Two very talented teams going at it. Um, and Oklahoma State, I believe, is playing ORU right now, and they are going yeah. into extra innings right now. Um, oh, are they? Oklahoma State was down, I want to say, two or three runs earlier in the game. They're, it's 9-9 now. They're going in the, in the extra innings. 9-9. Um, yeah, but, I mean, a little in-state rivalry there. Um, obviously OU played ORU earlier in the season and that's a solid program out there. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. Or Roberts is no slouch. Um, UConn ha hung 28 in baseball. They, they hung 28 on UMass 28, 28 to 11 for UConn. <laughs> I just pulled that's, up ESPN and saw that. 
<laughs> that's incredible. Yeah, that's crazy. So those are some, those are some series, um, you know, football, softball, baseball, you guys are going to have to check out. Just wanted to, um, you know, pick a few and, and ones that we'll have to watch and, and, and see what happens there. Some ranked matchups and obviously some new faces in football um, have to see how those shake out in the spring games. So um, that's all we got for you guys this week. Um, you know, as always, we say it every week. We appreciate you guys so much for listening. Um, you know, check out our social medias, just at fight song sports, uh, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, and then, you know, obviously we post our episodes to SoundCloud and YouTube both. Uh, you can check it out on both places. Um, you know, we'll be back again next week for you guys. Um, NFL draft next Thursday, correct? Yep. yep so correct. we will, uh, we'll pick, we'll pick um, some, some guys that we think are, are interesting names and just our overall thoughts for the NFL draft and, and what it means for the uh, schools and um, you know, who, who you know, where the guys are coming from, who they're losing. So um, that'll be a good one for us. And, and one you guys need to listen to get our thoughts on. So um, we'll be back again next week. And uh, thank you guys for listening.